Uh, welcome, everyone. So um, first of all, I'm really honored to be at Flink Forward again this year. Um, I'm, I'm personally really looking forward to having in-person Flink Forwards again, but I still think this is a great way um, to uh, meet the community and to exchange ideas. So in this talk, I want to take a look at Splunk's autopilot service. And this service can manage 10,000 of Flink jobs. So um, it has some interesting features like pipeline versioning, rollbacks, auto-tuning, and auto-scaling, which I'd like to present today. This is not open source, but, um, and uh, of course, some of the information is confidential, but I still think I'm gonna be able to share some pretty interesting insights into um, how stream processing at Splunk works. So my name is Max and I'm a principal engineer at Splunk. And um, so let's see, let's dive into the agenda now. So basically this is, uh, this talk is structured in uh, three sections. Well, actually four, but there's a double, the two is two times. Well, that's just how software works, right? Um, so um, I want to start off by um, giving you a bit of context on what Splunk does and why Flink is so important for Splunk. Then I wanna talk about Splunk's stream processing service. Over the years, there has been, um, has been, have been some architectural changes, specifically uh, regarding uh, the actual deployment and monitoring of the system. And um, the latest incarnation of, this, um, of these changes is autopilot which yeah, it's, it's kind of the state of art of, of managing stream processing deployments at Splunk. Another important aspect that we wanted to solve with autopilot is auto scaling. And we'll be going over the reasons for auto scaling and the different ways this can be implemented. And finally, um, very importantly, um, I wanna hear your questions. Uh, it would be great if we could have a discussion. I know this is, can be a little bit tricky, uh, online, but um, feel free to ask me anything. Post your questions in the, I think there's a Q&A tab um, so I can um, just answer them right away and we don't have any any delay because this is not, this is the stream streaming business here is not always real time. <laughs> so, okay, let's start. Um, so what is Splunk? Well, some of you may not know Splunk, but Splunk is used by 92% of the Fortune 100, which if I did the math right, makes about 92 companies uh, in the Fortune 100. And we have more than 8,000 employees already. Um, we have over 2 billion of revenue each year and over 20,000 customers. So some of those customers uh, are on this slide, you can see that we have customers in all kinds of industries, which um, I really, I guess really speaks uh, on its own for how important Splunk is for a lot of companies. Okay, but I'm not trying to sell you Splunk uh, because it's not a marketing talk. Um, so let's skip the marketing material. Many of us, um, no Splunk as the as the lock company, and this is certainly true because you can ingest locks and search them and process them. Um, but Splunk can do much more. Splunk is, has all kinds of products actually for um, storing all kinds of data. So it can be lock data. It um, can be events. It can be metrics. It can be application profiles. Um, all kinds of data can be ingested. And also Splunk targets different users like developers, administrators, data scientists, security analysts, um, also business users who wanna have you know nice dashboards and uh, corporate kind of summaries that, that's possible with Splunk too. So historically Splunk was mainly involved in on-prem, at least in its early days but um, it has been moving into the cloud for many years. And um, so this is, this is important to keep in mind. Um, and we do, have, we do have a stream processing product. And as you probably know or guessed already, it's built around Apache Flink. 
and we have it both um, on premise and in the cloud. The names differ slightly. So it's called data stream processor on prem and called stream processor service in the cloud, which um, I mean, it's essentially a very similar project, but of course there are certain challenges which arise to uh, both on prem and cloud, like for example, cloud, obviously like multi-tenancy and, um, um, and other cloud related challenges. So, um, this product basically is um, a way to use SPL, which is Splunk's proprietary search processing language. And these SPL programs get compiled into Flink jobs. So SPL is a lot like SQL actually, but um, it's it's very much tailored to uh, all the all the different search capabilities and that and query capabilities that you have in Splunk. It's it's, it's a quite interesting language, um, very useful. So historically, um, this the stream processing was all managed by a monolith service called the config service. And you so you have the UI and or the command line interface um, interacting with the API, and then you have a built in compiler to uh, compile to Flink jobs, you have deployment module, you have monitoring, and all this kind of is built um, with open source technology. So we have, we use Postgres um, for, um, for the database. We use Zookeeper for high availability. And now of course we, we deploy everything on Kubernetes. However, um, this design has proven not to be robust enough. Um, for example, um, changes to generally this monolith service requires like deploying uh, a new version of the compiler and the deployer um, just for you know making any changes to parts of the code so it's 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 kind of um you have to imagine that we also translate we we also chip like the thing fling functions that we compile to within this service so it's a, it's a huge monolith which is um, very hard to update and then also when you update you have to reactivate pipelines and this is performed or was performed in a kind kind of unreal reliable way, and generally there's no really good way to get like a consistent state of the deployments. It's all kind of best effort. If something goes wrong, like yeah, you're in trouble. So we wanted to fix this, and we we did actually fix this. But first, let me let me show you a brief view of the UI because I think it's it's kind of nice. You don't have to use the UI; you can use SPL. Yeah, but this is how it looks, the UI looks like. So um, now let's let's meet Autopilot. So Autopilot was designed to break apart the monolith and structure that we had and make it a lot more robust. The old config service um, does not strictly go away because we still have the compiler and all the other um, logic to, to um, translate into Flink jobs. We have that still present but we have we, we basically pulled out the control plane and and that's that's essentially autopilot so there are several services uh, which which can be operated and scaled individually in autopilot and the goal was to scale to ten thousands of running pipeline without a problem which i think uh, we reached that goal um, so this is a great achievement it also solves like long standing issues like supporting multiple versions of the same pipeline and migrating safely between them. This used to be uh, very difficult. For example, when we uh, bring up a new cluster, we capture a safe point of the old job. Then we cancel the old job and we bring up a new job on a new cluster. And then only once the new job runs, uh, we, we, we actually delete the old cluster. If, if anything goes wrong with submitting and restoring the the new version from a safe point, we can roll back to the old cluster. Um, so this is this is a much safer process, obviously, uh, than we used to have. Um, so just to go briefly over the components, so we have um, the clients interfacing through the UI or the command line interface with the config service. So this is basically the old part. Um, but the config service basically forwards um, all these deployment requests so it, it assembles the jobs, but forwards the deployment request to the so-called pipeline API. 
And there's a pipeline API, which basically uh, holds the st status quo of, of a pipeline. And then there's a status API, which, which you can query to see like um, how the deployment, which state the de deployment is currently. All this is, you know, persisted in databases. Um, so two different databases, one for the pipeline state, one for the actual uh, deployment state. And um, so, yeah, and then we have the, once you once you issue a request to the pipeline API, that gets to persist in the database, then the reconciler takes over and checks like, okay, does, um, is the, has, has the pipeline been updated? Do I need to you know, change anything about the current deployment? So if that's the case, the reconciler sends a message to this, this these letters, the message queue there. And um, then the command processor, it, it translates, um, it basically executes these requests from the reconciler and save the state to the current database. And um, yes, and this involves also calling out to Maestro, which is our way to deploy on Kubernetes. You don't have to care about that, but basically we then uh, issue um, Kubernetes calls and and the deployment itself, they they are have a monitor component. You can see that on the on the right side. So um, the monitor monitor uh, messages also go back to the message queue, and then the command processor can take action depending on uh, what kind of you know if we have a failed deployment, or um, also we monitor the we we send metrics through this message queue. So I think this explains it pretty well. Maybe if you have more questions, then um, feel free to post them in the chat. So why autoscaling actually? There are two primary reasons for autoscaling. One is probably the most important one. We want to save resources, right? Um, it's wasteful to use too many resources, resources but it's also costly. So our current setup spins up uh, a job cluster, so basically dedicated Flink cluster per pipeline. And this requires um, several pods. It's actually two job managers and one task manager. But we can probably decrease this number to even just one, uh, which, we, um, which we are actually doing. Um, so, but many times we have you know, customers running at higher parallelism and we wanna you know, make sure Everything runs efficiently, but at the same time, re make effective resource of uh, make effective use of the resources. And we are we even thinking about scaling pipelines to zero, which are not actually processing any data. But on the other hand, we also want to scale out because if uh, you know we want to process customers' data in a timely manner, and if you have, if the customer has set up some kind of some kind of SLA with like, uh, for throughput latency, we want to make sure to meet that um, SLA. Okay. So, what are the options when it comes to auto scaling? So, many people recommend to use uh, Flink's reactive mode with the Kubernetes HBA. We are not actually using that. Um, for one, it's a quite new and experimental feature. It, it certainly works, uh, but it requires some tinkering, for example, tuning the heartbeat timeout to work reli reliably, which probably will not be the case in the future, but for now it was not an option for us. Another more important reason is also that we wanna be, we don't wanna hand over scaling decisions to Flink. Because we, as the as the control plane, autopilot is the control plane, we want to remain in control and and you know control exactly when we do the rescale and how. And then and related to that is um, that the reactive mode is actually not granular enough because we want to scale. We want to scale at task level as opposed to just adjusting the the global parallelism. We want to be able to tune every task's, tasks parallelism. And finally, the reactive mode with HBA does not really solve the hardest problem, knowing when to scale up and down. So um, yeah, we, we tune at the job graph level and 
And um, we also have the auto tuner, which tunes uh, the job manager, task manager memory and the required network buffers, which I think is, is often overlooked when, when scaling jobs that you can adjust these parameters as well. So why is auto scaling hard? Well, auto scaling is hard because load patterns are usually not known upfront and they vary from each task in the job graph. And you, you typically have a measurement of like something between zero and one for the load. And if you have one, for instance, or zero, it's really hard to know, you know how much you have to scale up or down to, to reach a state where um, the load is sort of balanced. And then the load patterns can also be jittery or bursty, right? So we don't want to want to scale up too fast. And for like, if there's sudden burst, there's a sudden burst. And we also don't want to scale down um, or up all the time because of jittery data. And yeah, load patterns tend to change over time. So auto scale needs to be adaptive. And load patterns are also in, at least in the job graph, they are dependent on each other. So through the data flow, and also um, through how, how um, the deployment actually happens on the nodes. Um, if you have some noisy neighbors, for example. Um, yeah, and scaling is expensive. It requires a job restarts and downtime tends to build a backlog. So, whoops. Um, so there is some really good, um, there's a good paper which reviews Auto scaling techniques for um, cloud environments. It's it's a very uh, general kind of paper, but I rec recommend reading it. Um, it's it's always a problem to have, you know, one approach that fits everything. That's certainly um, you need to look at specifics of each system to scale it well. What what we generally found that a threshold based approach uh, combined with time series analysis works works pretty well, um, but I'm gonna um, explain how this works a little bit further, but I recommend, recommend reading this article if you wanna get into auto scaling. So first step for auto scaling is to aggregate metrics. Otherwise we don't know whether, we should, whether the system is loaded or not. So in a Flink job, just to give you a brief reminder, metrics are scoped by job, node, task, or operator. And I stole this graphic from the from the Flink website. So you can see that at a logical level, there's a job graph, and it has these job vertices, or also task vertices, sometimes called task vertices, and they trans and they get at runtime get translated to the execution graph. And at the execution graph, you have um, parallel instances for every job vertex, which are called execution vertices. So we in Flink. Um, we have quite interesting metrics. Um, on a node level, we have system CPU memory, um, but on the operator or task level, we have num bytes in, num records in, we have the idle time, millisecond per second or busy time, which um, really give you a lot of information on the load of a single ex of a single subtask or execution vertex, if you will. And um, yeah, we wanna, we wanna um, take this information and then adapt the job graph, um, change the job graph of the, par the parallelism at the job graph level based on that, on these metrics. So um, for that, we have these cluster reports that are sent by the monitor component of the autopilot service. And um, so, we have um, combiners because we have these all these metrics from the different subtypes. We have combiners in place, which um, can take the average, um, the maximum, minimum of the um, of these subtask metrics, and then typically we also combine multiple reports into one to and apply a moving average or an exponential average. This is really a must, I think, to reduce uh, jittery or bursty data. Because you cannot assume you get you get like uh, perfect metrics from from Flink or any kind of running system which uh, experience like changes in the load, you know, all the time. Of course. 
So as for the sources of information, we have um, we have the source backlog, the task utilization, and the data flow itself. So the autoscaler uses the source backlog to kind of know, okay, how, how big is my backlog and how much processing power do I need to fully process this backlog, or at least make sure it doesn't grow. Um, because we can only, I mean, we should we shouldn't like grow our backlog to infinity, and there's typically some limits onto how large a backlog can can grow over time. And um, then we have the task utilization, which kind of give us a hint like whether like the tasks um, make effective resource uh, use of of their resources. And you can use these metrics that I, I named, or you can you can also take a look at the threat CPU time, which is pretty interesting. And finally, you have the data flow. So if you scale up, for instance, uh, one task and um, that task generates a lot more data, you, you probably want to take a look at um, looking at the downstream tasks and, and seeing if they could be effective, affected. So yeah, basically, that's that's how our auto scaling, our auto scaler works. Uh, you know, it's slightly simplified, but um, in essence, this is how it works. So we use the backlog data, metadata to set a, ba a baseline. We scale the tasks. We we do the load propagation within the data flow, and then we train also at the same time um, a model which um, kind of learns how the load behaves. And then, of course, we do a cooldown after each decision to make sure that we get clean data again. So how do you, do you remain backlog free? Well, I have some equations for you, you here, uh, which might be fun to look at. So the backlog size, uh, the, the new backlog size, when we do a rescale, is the current backlog size um, plus the time it takes to rescale multiplied by the backlog growth rate. I think that makes sense. And the backlog processing rate is the current backlog processing rate divided by uh, you know the current parallelism multiplied by the new parallelism, so that that gives you the new processing rate, and then we have the final equ equation, the catch-up time, which is the backlog size, the new backlog size um, divided by the processing rate, new processing rate divided by uh, minus the the backlog growth rate. Of course, yeah, this um, this is a kind of model which could be even more complex, but um, it's already pretty accurate. And if you solve this now for uh, P new, for new parallelism, um, then you get, well, you get the new parallelism um, for to remain more or less backlog free. And I leave that act as an exercise to you actually, um, but I think you can figure it out. So and then um, the task utilization algorithm. So I pretty much already said this, but um, so we take a look at all the individual job vertices or tasks in the job graph, and then we use uh, a threshold. Based on this, uh, we have a high and a low threshold. Based on that, we we um, decide whether we want to lo look at scaling. And um, in, the, in the initial phase, it's it's not super easy to scale, but um, we after we we've done uh, scaling, we kind of know how the load pattern behaves, and we can build a model based of that. And we we continue to re refine that task utilization model based on the observed load and the parallelism. And there are some models that you can read it in the paper, like you know linear regression, machine learning, auto regression that you can use um, to to continually adjust this this model. Um, so how do you adjust the parallelism? Like very simplistically, um, if you basically, you can just take, if you have the current metric, MM current, and you have your target, the, the, the target, uh, the load, the value of the metric that you would like it to be at, you can um, divide the, the current metric by the target and multiply it uh, by uh, the current parallelism. And that gives you uh, that gives you the the actual new parallelism um, to reach the target. For example, if you have parallelism four, and you you wanna you have currently one point zero load full load, and your target is zero point five, 
you divide 1.0 by 0 0.5, and that's 2. And you multiply it by the current person, that's 4. And so you have 8. Similarly, for scaling down, you have, uh, for example, parallelism of 8. And current is 0 0.1. Target metric is 0 0.5. Divide 0 0.1 by, by 0 0.5, which is 0 0.2, and divide, uh, multiply that by 8. That's 1.6. You round it up, so you are at 2. So this works pretty well, actually. Um, of course, you need to take care to um, properly, uh, pro properly prepare your data so it's not bursty and jittery, but it works pretty well um, if you don't have like super strict lower and upper bounds um, than it, so for the threshold for, for deciding when to scale. So in the, to conclude here, um, some lessons learned that you might wanna watch out for. Always assume jittery and bursty data. Uh, it's pretty much a given. Then um, what I just showed, scaling proportionally with a factor, uh, works very well, actually, if you prepare the data well enough. And on the contrary, if you just use a fixed parallelism delta, that's actually too slow um, and not adaptive enough. So you want to have something proportional. Then you have to do some, some fine tuning, of course, to make sure that um, you, you to solve the edge cases. And this is best done by, by a trained model. Very important though, if you use a model, the model needs to be retrained because it becomes obsolete quite quickly when the load pattern changes. Generally, you wanna start simple, very simple rules, very simple process for scaling, and then adjust um, the complexity over time. You also want to look at simulating uh, your autoscaler um, and start with simple and then complex load patterns, which also change over time. time. So you, they shouldn't be static, never, because uh, that just will give you, I mean, we'll let the test pass, but won't give you real world kind of uh, simulation. And of course, the best simulation uh, is uh, just using real world data. And that's a little bit more tricky to do, but um, that's definitely something you, you should look at when developing auto scaling. So testing, um, for testing, we um, we have, you know, of course, the usual unit test and integration test and to end test, specifically also with using Flink's mini cluster functionality, which is quite useful for um, getting like a full end to end signal. Uh, including uh, actual metrics from the task. But we also built like a simulation for synthetic workloads with um, also um, generated job graphs. And um, so the important point is here to generate per task load patterns, uh, which, which can be, uh, yeah, which are different for every task. Then you also should add some jitter and uh, vary those load patterns over time. And super important is to keep this repeatable and deterministic. So for example, by inserting a seat, uh, make sure like you can actually, when, when your test simulation fails or your test fails, that you can actually go back and repeat and understand why, why your algorithm or your model is not working. And finally, of course, we have some real world data sets, which we test with. For the future work, we're looking at classifying pipelines into pipeline groups. So um, we can actually skip kind of the model building phase and directly start with, with um, a pre-built model. Of course, this requires storing all model data centrally, which we don't do currently, but we're looking into that. We also wanna um, make the model more sophisticated to um, sort of anticipate intraday load patterns and sort of uh, scale Pro very proactively before even um, before even any of the metrics change. Um, so not reactively, but proactively. We also need to take a look at hotkeys, which are problematic because right now we, we assume that we can um, linearly scale. And uh, with if you have petitions which are hot, you might wanna take a look at those and try to um, uh, move those hotkeys, uh, isolate them, or you know, find some strategy for dealing with these hot partitions. But this um, also requires probably changing the job graph 
which we currently don't want to do. We just want to change the task parallelisms. Um, and also, of course, really great it would be to to um, scale individual tasks without a job restart. We we are thinking about doing this, but um, it's obviously a little bit more involved. Um, so we are not there yet. And another thing we want to look at is vertical scaling, because if you have a way to vertical scale, you can just, for example, adapt CPU or memory at a node without even restarting uh, the Flink job. So that's that's a very quick way to scale, which we might want to leverage for some use cases. So in conclusion, we have learned about Autopilot, which is Splunk's robust and scalable uh, microservice for scaling to 10,000 of Flink pipelines. We have learned, you know, you know, at least got an idea how to auto scale Flink pipelines. Yeah, aggregating metrics, scaling based off backlog task utilization and uh, learn models. And now I'm really curious uh, to hear your questions in the Q&A tab. So um, let's move to the Q&A. Uh, okay. I see some questions here. Um, so, okay. Um, uh, Ruslan asked um, about vertical scaling and, oh, okay. many questions coming in. <laughs> so how do you combine horizontal and vertical scaling? Uh, we currently don't, well, we, we do it to some degree. So we have the option to set an, an ap application profile, which, uh, sets the, the resource types that are used for, for the deployments. But the auto scaler currently only scales horizontally. But as I said, we probably will work on vertical scaling uh, with the auto scaler as well. Um, so, what typical use cases do you have for Spunk stream, stream processing service? That's a good question. I mean, it's probably a better question to ask some support uh, or um, sales engineer because um, uh, they work with more customers. But we have both users internally and externally. We um, uh, we have a lot of internal customers that build products, uh, for example, for observability with with the stream processor service. We have also external customers which. Um, Cannot tell you so much, but they they um, process a lot of real time uh, financial data with it. So um, it's really flexible. I mean, it's as flexible as Flink. You know, um, it it really gives you um, pretty much all the power of Flink. Um, can you give an example that shows per task auto scaling significantly better than job level scaling? Eh. That's a that's a good question. So, de depends on what you define as better. I mean, I'd say if you, I mean, if you if you are concerned about effective resource usage, then the task level scaling is the way to do to go because obviously you can you can drastically reduce the parallelism of some of the tasks which are you know just idling around, and you can increase the ones that uh, which are really doing the heavy lifting. So um, you end up with a lot less um, resources um, uh, that uh, resources that you that you, you have to allocate when deploying the job. So but it's a it's a good question. We thought about just using job level parallelism. And that's, that's, um, I think that's that works pretty well. But we want to squeeze out uh, all of the uh, as much performance as possible and, and and save resources wherever possible all right so and there's another question how do you incorporate the cost of rescaling the state into your decision that's a really good question so right now we don't deal with this so much. Instead, we 
we are very we are more conservative when when we scale so um we don't we don't try to to get perfect load balance uh or perfect um, utilization but we try to um let's say we perform a lot of um pre pre um, processing of the data to get in a state where we are pretty confident that we need to scale but it is it is a good point that you want to probably uh, account for the costs of scaling itself and influence that in the decision and there's another question when do we actually consider our deployment stable if if we if we rolled a new version of a pipeline and we um, we spin up a new job cluster how when do we know that the new deployment is stable and we don't we can delete the old one well um, currently we just we just wait until the new job is in running state and um, so the question was, do we do we wait until the first checkpoint? As far as I know, we don't. We just see if all the tasks go into running state, and then we assume that things are working. And you know, if if then if then something goes wrong, you know, we could still roll back to the old job um, in in case um, in case we have to. But right now. Uh, we assume things are working, but it's a good question actually, because there can be some uh, failure in the pipeline that only surfaces a little bit later. Currently, we we treat these we treat this um, you know as independently from the old pipeline, but we could of course have some grace period where we then uh, roll back to the old version uh, on on a failure. And finally, there's a question, how would you scale individual tasks without restarting the rest? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a hard question. That it's certainly solvable. Other systems have, have done it as well. And maybe Flink will look uh, in, in doing this also, but um, it's, you know, it, it I can I can imagine like you know processing stopping and um, just a single task being uh, redeployed. Um, of course, it it it's quite challenging with regards to repartitioning state and um, yeah, making sure and nothing breaks. But I can see that this is possible. If not online, which would be ideal, then at least you know without having to cancel all the tasks. Uh, just ex less just switching um, certain tasks um, but it's definitely tricky